You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all the Star Trek TV series, movies, and more. And today we're discussing the season finale of Lower Decks called Old Friends, New Planets. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today on the panel are Jimmy Aiken. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. And Father Corey Stika. Hey, Father Corey. How's it going? Folks, be sure to stick around. We have more of your uh, wonderful listener feedback that we love to get. And we'll have that at the end of the episode. And uh, I want you to remember to like The Secrets of Star Trek wherever you find us on Facebook, where we're at facebook.com slash Media. Retweet us on Twitter, where we're at SQPN. We're also on Instagram at StarQuest Network. And be sure to leave us comments wherever you find us online. We love to hear from you. And uh, I want to tell you about another show on the StarQuest Network you're sure to enjoy called The Secrets of Middle Earth. You can find that wherever fine podcasts are found or at sqpn.com slash Middle Earth. And to get things started, Jimmy, can you give us a recap of what happens in this episode? This week, Nick Lacarno introduces Mariner to Nova Fleet, a, the collection of ships that he's been putting together following the string of lower deck mutinies. He has the fleet in a star system that is protected by a Trinar shield, a shield made by three Binars. He's also got a Ferengi Genesis device to deter other governments from interfering with Nova Fleet, and he plans to demand respect throughout the Quadrant and to expand Nova Fleet. To that end, he makes a Quadrant-wide recruiting broadcast, and he puts Mariner on mic, thinking that she's on his side and will help sway more Lower Deckards to his cause as an important Admiral's daughter. But she br- betrays Locarno and says that he sucks and he's a total <laughs> loser. She then escapes from Locarno's headquarters and takes the Ferengi Genesis device. Mariner is then chased through the system by members of Nova Fleet, and she starts using psychological warfare tactics to get the members of the different races to question Locarno's leadership. Meanwhile, Starfleet has decided to take the situation slow because it's a delicate situation involving many governments. However, Captain Freeman defies orders and is determined to rescue Mariner. To get through the shield, they go to Orion, where Devana Tindy bargains with her sister to Erica to get an Orion battle cruiser to get through the shield guarding the solar system. The cost will be Devana coming back to work for the Syndicate. But it turns out that the ship is a derelict, and the only way to use it is to destroy it by smashing it into the shield to create a temporary opening. Captain Freeman and her senior officers take the Captain's yacht through the opening, leaving all the Lower Deckers in charge of the Cerritos with Brad Boimler as acting captain. Inside the system, Locarno has Mariner surrounded, but she plunges into a nebula with the Genesis device, very much like the climax of Wrath of Khan. Locarno's allies don't think that they need the Genesis device, and they abandon him and leave. Locarno then follows Mariner into the nebula, where Mariner has the Genesis device set on a timer to detonate so that Locarno can't have it. However, when they come face to face, Locarno won't leave, thinking he can disarm the bomb. Captain Freeman then beams Mariner to safety, and Locarno discovers that he's wrong about disarming the bomb, because the Ferengi put a paywall on it that requires him to deposit two bars of gold-pressed latinum to turn it off. His molecules then become part of a newly terraformed planet that Starfleet plans to use as a refugee center. And because she helped open relations with the Orions, Captain Freeman won't have charges pressed against her for violating orders. Mariner announces that she's now worked through all she's been processing and has come to terms with her new rank and will try not self-sabotaging in the future. Talyn also announces that she no longer wants her plans to go back to the Vulcan fleet and will remain on the Cerritos. But Devana still has to go back to Orion, much to Rutherford's distress. However, the others assure him that Devana will be back soon. And once aboard the Orion ship, Devana confidently assures herself that she's got this. The end. Mm. That was a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um... Overall impressions? Father Corey, what was your overall impression of this one? This was a, a really enjoyable episode. This was a great episode. It was a great uh, conclusion to all the season arc of, of the, the missing ships and all that. It was very well done. Of course, you know, they brought in elements from throughout the, the, the season uh, with the Orions and things like that. You know, uh, it was just it was it was so much fun. And if you couldn't tell by Jimmy's summary, it was a very action packed, very full 
episode for for half an hour, including credits, half an hour. That was there's a lot going on in this one. Mm. Uh, how about you, Jimmy? Yeah, I enjoyed it very much. I appreciated the little setups for things that at the time seemed like throwaways, like the Ferengi Genesis device that turns out to, I mean, not only did we see the Ferengi Genesis device in a previous episode, but the fact it's a Ferengi device mm-hmm. sets us up for there's going to be a paywall to de- yeah. to, to turn <laughs> yeah. off the detonation function. <laughs> yes. And so they had that all mapped out ahead of time, and that was really nice. It was, it was a lot of fun. I liked uh, seeing Nick Locarno again. Um, I liked, I loved how Boimler and Rutherford have a dispute yes. about whether yes. or not he looks like Tom <laughs> Paris. Yeah. <laughs> and, it looks like Tom Paris. I don't see it. <laughs> yeah. yeah so they have literally the same face. Yeah. Um, it was, it was nice that they did that. They also brought back the Mark Twaining as a form of reconciliation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, and I especially liked how they handled Cito Jaxa um, Mm -hmm. because they could have brought her back and I would have been okay if they'd brought her back because it's been so long. Um, you know, if they established that she had not died back in TNG because we didn't see Mm -hmm. a body, they could have established that, but they didn't, but they did still bring her back in a flashback and they had the original actress portray her, which was awesome, which was really great. We got to see her again and, and leaving her apparently dead. I'm fine with that too, because Mm -hmm. I, this is one of those cases where, you know, being a comic book fan, it doesn't bug me when they bring characters back, at least most of the time. There are a few characters that I would definitely want to stay dead and feel that it cheapened what they did mm-hmm. by bringing them back. Um, for me, the key is not do you cheapen their sacrifice by bringing them back, but do you cheapen their sacrifice by bringing them back and doing something stupid with them right? as opposed yeah. to doing something great with them? Like, I think they totally redeemed Tasha Yar's death when they brought her back. They they right. ennobled her death by bringing mm-hmm. her back. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so the the key for me is what do you do with the character once they're back? If you if you use if you do good stuff with the character once they're back, I don't mind them coming back, even if they had made a heroic sacrifice before. But he but I do understand that, you know there can be different perspectives on that. And I understand that in this format to just bring Cito Jaxa back, it's like, she's not going to be part of the regular crew. Mm -hmm. You're not going to do a lot with her. So I could see in this situation, bringing her back could cheapen her original death. And, and because they wouldn't be able to tell us great new Cito Jaxa stories. Mm. Um, so, so I was fine and actually appreciate them leaving her apparently dead, given that they're not going to be doing anything with her in the future. Well, and, and especially since she would be coming back as a villain instead of as, you know, a good person, you know, where she, you know, she came back as part of the Carnal's crew. Mm -hmm. She would be coming back as someone who was willing to Uh, give her life for the Federation, but then turned around and betrayed the Federation. Oh, yeah. No, that would be terrible. Um, What I was imagining they might do is bring her back and then have her have a final confrontation with Nick Locarno about loyalty and and have her be be the solution to the plot for the good guys. Um, The problem with that is you then deprive the established good guys Mm-hmm. of being the solution. And that's, and, and that's why I didn't see that happening. I, I, that's why yeah. I saw it being, she would be on his side. Yeah. Um, that would be terrible. But I, I, yeah. I, I love the flat. I love the flashback. Cause then of course you get Will, Will Wheaton as Wesley Crusher in his most awkward, which was has great. Will, Will Wheaton now been on more. Like, has he been the most, uh, let's see the most cameoed of the old Trek classic Trek in I the new Trek. I don't know. War, in the new Trek, maybe, but Worf was the one who at least has been the record holder for appearing most on most series. That's but true. Now, now, if you want to talk about guest stars, you got <laughs> yeah. Clint Howard is like, he's got to yeah. be the top. Clint Howard has been in everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It may be Wes, Wesley Crusher is now challenging Michael Dorn for, or, mm-hmm. you know, Worf for a, most most series to be appeared in. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, Although I don't think so, because Wesley never appeared on Voyager or Deep Space Nine. 
Correct. And Worf did Worf did in Deep Space Nine, and yep. has kept up with Wesley by appearing on, in Picard, and so I think Worf's still going to be ahead. Well, I was thinking of the new stuff, so um, Picard and Lower Decks, and I'm just thinking. I thought Will Wheaton was in one he of was the in a movie. other. He, he was, was in a movie. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in any case, that's kind of a yeah. side side point. My overall impression, I agree with both. I really love this one. Uh, it was a great. Great finale, uh, great conclusion, uh, really brings a bunch of things together, a lot, and, and the usual heavy on the callbacks to, call, to the, the old Star Trek season, uh, series that we love, uh, in multiple uh, ones, mm-hmm. TNG, Wrath of mm-hmm. Khan, so all that stuff, so good, and then calling back to previous scene this season, so it, it masterful. You know, it's interesting, we talked about last time, uh, Mike McMahon, showrunner, Mike McMahon's comment that the last couple episodes of this season are a big swing and that's why they're holding back on even the titles of the episodes and meaning a big swing as in a baseball swing so we're like really yeah. trying to knock this yeah. out of the park right and uh I, I, my point of view is i think they they hit it like they i think mm-hmm. this really oh, these yeah. really were the two best episodes of the season frankly and uh, uh, yeah, I was, I was, I think it was a great way to go out on the, on the, uh, on the season. So it was fantastic. Um, by the way, Shannon Phil, the actress who played Cedar Jackson has not really acted mm-hmm. much since the mid nineties. Mm. So she came back to acting for this, which is, was just fun. I'm glad that they got her to, to come back and reprise her role. I mean, she, in this. she only had a couple of lines, but they were, you know, they were great. And they, you know, really showed more of the character filled in the character. <laughs> I think I think Cedo Jackson has been a somewhat beloved character of fans. Oh, yeah, because awesome. of her noble sacrifice. Yeah, I, so uh, it's great that she's done this. And maybe she'll go. To, I don't know if she does conventions, but maybe she, you know she'll have a Hayden Christensen moment. I, I don't think she was ever yeah. not liked like Hayden, like uh, Anakin was, but uh, you know, <laughs> hopefully she'll have that moment where her her popularity well, is revived again. Well, not just noble sacrifice, but also the fact that she did have a conversion. Where you know she was part of Nova Squadron and was part of the the whole yeah. the whole event that caused caused them to get kicked out, but she had that turn where then she became part of the crew of the Enterprise and then right. gave her life. You know, mm-hmm. very that much redemptive. a conversion. Redemption. Yeah, I also liked that in this in the flashback to when they were all at the academy together. We get to see we get to see all but one member of Nova Squadron. Yes, uh, who was another woman that appeared in the original episode, uh, the first duty. Mm-hmm. Um, but we finally get to see Joshua Albert, the right. cadet who died because yeah. we never saw him in the first duty. He was already dead. Yep. And here we get to actually see him in the flashback, which is nice. Yep. We also see, uh, so Gene Hajar is the other one who is mm-hmm. seen, but not heard in this, in this, uh, flashback, but also, uh, we see Boothby in the background as well, which is I, fun. I, I, oh, nice. I noted that in as well, uh, just another one of the Easter eggs. We do get to see Boothby, the gardener at the Academy that had a big influence on Picard, um, as a young man. And he's, he's there tending the garden. Yeah. Yep. One, one thing it, it that flashback did show is the weakness of their animation style is they had to literally call out, isn't that right? Wesley. Yeah, right. You know, right. you had to make, had to make sure, sure, sure you knew that was Wesley, that, that that one person standing there was Wesley. That's just that's, that's just a weakness of the animation style. Yeah, yeah. It's not it's not photorealistic. So uh, the other thing that I want to bring up from our previous discussion was uh, Mariner's age. So we see here she's a second year cadet, which makes her, uh, according to memory alpha, approximately 20. So maybe 19 yeah. or 20 which would put her roughly around 32 or 33 years old at the time of lower decks. So mm-hmm. she's an right. older lower decker, you know, which you know, junior officer, which based, is you know, based on her career and what we know about her self-sabotaging. Yeah. Yeah. Makes which sense. is still better than Picard in his alternate reality where he, uh, you know, never got beyond Lieutenant and was in his forties or fifties yeah. or whatever it was <laughs> at 60s. the time. See, well, was he? No, he 50s. wasn't. In his no, but, Pet, the character Captain Picard, or the character Jean Luc Picard, is older than the actor Patrick Stewart. Really? Because of oh. improvements in medical technology in the next 400 years. Okay. Well, and, and right. Patrick Stewart was in his mid 40s when he played. Mm-hmm. When he played Picard? Yeah. When originally. initially. Yeah. Yeah. But his yeah. character in season one of Next Gen was supposed to be like 60 years old. Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting. Okay. I suppose that makes sense. If people are living longer and staying young longer, it would. You might have that um, take, take longer. Um, 
So, yeah, so we had Cito, and we had that nice flashback, so that was good. Uh, but then we come into the, the present. I, interestingly, the interaction between Locarno and Mariner, like, they didn't really, like, in the past, Locarno kind of dismissed Mariner as a hanger-on for Cito, mm -hmm. but in the in the present, he treats her like, oh, yeah, you were, you know, like, almost like you were a member of Nova Squadron. Yeah, and, and he... He, he's doing that to his advantage because he wants yeah. to use her to recruit more people. Exactly. Right. So he's trying to make her feel valued. Yeah, that was right. that 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 felt more like the oh yeah yeah you know sales but oh yeah we we've known each other for years and you are such an important part of our crew and that's why you need to work with us you know. Okay, so now it's like new, just trying to get her on his side, and yeah. uh, we've always been buddies, right? What yeah, what no. I don't <laughs> what I don't get is how bad he is at picking up on the fact she's not on his side <laughs> because, <terrible. laughs> because he's he he like she's she's throwing she's trying to make it sound like she may be on his side. But she's thrown off so many opposite signals to that conclusion. Like at one point, he sits down in his captain's chair on Nova One, his own ship, the mystery ship, and says, how do I look? And she says, confident, but, you know, like in a creepy way. <laughs> like, okay, that should have been a giveaway. You may not want to put this woman on mic. Well, but, but he even says, good, that's what I'm going for. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's funny how I, I I wasn't sure how Mariner would react like he gave his speech and then put her on screen to get a, give her spiel to the to the fellow lower deckers mm -hmm. and he expected her to you know to give a sales pitch and I wasn't I had to I'll be honest I wasn't sure what Mariner would do there would she you know well, try to be subtle or would she just be well, what she did which was he's a wacko Stay well, away. She play, they play that so well because you know she, she's like what oh i'm gonna be on hi everyone uh what am i gonna do oh i know let's call him out yeah <laughs> i i like how her reaction also is written in a way that fits mariner's character you know, it's like this guy sucks. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's a total loser. <laughs> yes, right, right. <laughs> uh, I, I what another one of my favorite lines or like uh, like side little side lines was uh, when Locarno when he does put that call to everyone to to whoever else felt overlooked by their captains to join the first independent fleet in the Alpha Quadrant. And Boimler kind of says, uh, the Maquis would like a word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was good. I like that. <laughs> so uh, uh, the interesting thing is, is to see seeing Captain Freeman go rogue, which is not surprising, but they don't play up the fact that she's going rogue to save her daughter. No mm. one mentions that. It's just to save one of her crew. Yeah. And it's interesting how they often they downplay that relationship between the two of them which, in the series. Which they would, because if you're Captain Freeman, you can't let your crew feel like you, you're you willing to rescue your daughter, but not them. Right. right. Or at risking of their life, right? Put yeah. their life in the line. Yeah. Well, even even the Carno, he, you know, he says, we've, we've kept, got the daughter of a, a prominent admiral. And never mind that. Captain Freeman is known, would be known by this point yeah. for everything that the Cerritos has done. You know, they might be a second class ship, but they're, they're, she's definitely known, if nothing else, for the trial. You know? Right. Mm -hmm. So this this is also a, a bad example of um, military decision making, because in reality, you would not want a daughter serving on her mother's no. ship. No, <laughs> that would be that's that's a, a recipe for disaster. Yes. And it could destroy both of their careers. Right. Um, but More they let people. Morale and everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. But they let people take small children on ships in the 24th <laughs> century. So they make a lot of bad military decisions. They do. They do. Well, and, yeah. And people destroy their, their ships and then they get the next, the E model of it. Oh, I mean. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so w when Freeman asks the crew, you know, it, to, to, to volunteer to go rogue with her, uh, you know, and everyone says yes. Talin has a great line. She just says, a Cerrito strong, which yeah. I want that shirt. I, I, no, I want that shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uncharacteristically emotional for Talen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's just funny how that thing would become would mm -hmm. would stick around for the next mm -hmm. few hundred years. That that kind of phrase. Um, another thing I really like was how Rutherford refers to to Erica 
uh, it one because he has he sometimes has these creepy phrases. No can do ten d two. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Another one of my favorite lines. Um, uh, for the ship geeks among us, Mariner steals a Federation ship that uh, that uh, the Locarno has, uh, which is a saber runner class mm-hmm. ship. Uh, which we we had seen the steam run. It's a kind of a um, a mashup of the old steam runner and another class saber something um, that we'd seen in one of the movies. I think it was could be, uh, yeah. But uh, that was fun to see. Uh, I like to see them bring out that. That's the thing is I like with lower decks is they don't just throw out you know the same ship design over and over. They 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 care about the details. Uh, of stuff, even like the, the yeah, ship even designs. for even for rivet counters, you know, to, to have a, a the NCC number to be uh, the right time period and everything, and you know, yeah, unlike Discovery, um, I saw something about the the actually something about uh, now I can't find it the the this, the NCC number on that ship and the name was a tribute to someone who had died, um, mm. and so that it was their uh, the the day they died, I think, was the number. Uh, reference like oh five twenty six eighteen or something like that. Um, so it's interesting there. <laughs> I liked I liked the fact that we get two new rules of acquisition in this episode. Yes, it's been so long. Um, according to Mariner, rule ninety one is your boss is only worth what he pays you, hmm. which yep. is a good rule of acquisition. And then mm-hmm. now the canonical rules of acquisitions that previously have ended up with um with have ended with uh 285 um but the we're given 289 which would suggest this is a new rule that's only been recently introduced presumably as part of Rom's reforms hmm. however it doesn't sound particularly Rami because yeah. 289 is we're told is shoot first count profits later <laughs> and that sounds much more classic Ferengi than Rom yeah. Ferengi Right, it does. It does. By the uh, way, I just looked it up. The the Pissarro, the USS Pissarro, was named yeah. for Fabio Pissarro, who worked for Eagle Moss. Remember, Eagle Moss did all the models. He's the one that created the CAD files that they then used to create the models. And it's the registry is his birthday, May twenty sixth, nineteen seventy. The because mm. it's okay. five twenty six seventy is the right registry. Right. Nice. Very nice. Nice tribute. Um. Yeah, I really like the way that the show really they they really dig into things like the people who made the models that you could buy, like the toys mm-hmm. and stuff. You know, I just really I love that aspect of the show. It's one of the things that really endears Lower Decks to me, uh, even ab- above other shows. I really feel like that this this group really gets it. Uh, yeah. So one of the things that they do when they go as part of the negotiation process to get the Orion ship is, you know, they go back to Orion and Erica is saying she's too busy and, you know, there are complicating factors. She's not going to give him a ship. And Devana then or then challenges her to barter by combat, <laughs> which is right. an interesting procedure we hit here on earth we've had <laughs> trial by combat but i guess with the orion commercial piratey interests barter by combat is an acceptable alternative to regular barter um and so each side has to pick a champion and they the orion side picks this enormous orion woman named beth who is beth. like <laughs> yeah. yeah instead of beth um, who is as one of the characters even comments, she's like two and a half shaxes, you know, she's <laughs> just enormous and looks like she could pound any of them into the dirt, any of the Cerritos crew into the dirt. And Devana is like, no, 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 we totally got this. And she names for her champion, Dr. Miglimo. <laughs> yes. And uh, who is in immediately perplexed by his assignment. Um, but Devon has got a plan up her sleeves. She happens to know that Beth has extreme allergies. And right. so she tells Dr. Miglimo to fluff his down. And he's like, but it's embarrassing. <laughs> fluff your down. And he <laughs> puffs up and releases so many histamines into the environment that um, De Erica has an allergy attack and unfortunately falls on Dr. Miglimo. <laughs> group, yeah. pinning, <laughs> pinning him pinning him to the ground thus allowing Beth to be declared the winner mm. and um 
I think you could dispute that and say maybe they're neither one of them won. It was a draw. If, <laughs> yeah, if yeah. is unconscious, I don't think you can win when you're con- when when you're unconscious. Um, but that then leads to to Erica's counter proposal of you come back and work for the syndicate, right? Because so that because what she'd done was put up the Cerritos against the Orion battleship, yeah. and and then. Uh, to Erica oh, yeah. says, "What do I want with a with a third class, a second class, or third class ship?" And like, hey, <laughs> now, and Phillips gets mad at that point, like Scotty yeah. did. And yeah. Uh, well, yeah, so yeah. Did, did you notice, Don, that the unlock sequence for the codes was the was a Touch ID or like a Android Touch? Oh, so right. like when you touch the display to unlock your phone, it's, it's that's the through screen. To, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the through screen yeah. face fingerprint. Yeah. By the way, speaking of bad military decisions, um, Captain Freeman is really lucky this came <laughs> off because <laughs> yeah. being willing to barter your ship, which includes classified technology, um, yeah, maybe not that be an option. <laughs> What so, do you mean you lost your ship? <laughs> I, <a> like, <laughs> I like the fact that the Orion battleship, that when they discover that it's completely derelict, uh, they do this whole um, switcheroo thing where Boimler's in command of the Cerritos, acting captain, very assertive. He does a great job, mm-hmm. actually, yeah. with this. Good captain it's, voice. And he's to- they're, they're towing this Orion ship, and he's talking to uh, Dr. Captain Freeman on the communicator, and my first assumption was, oh, she's on the Orion ship, mm-hmm. and then it turned, and then they they fling the ship with the with the tractor beam at the the shield, and it turns out they're just blasting through the shield with this enormous ship, and it's the captain's yacht, which no one ever uses, which is yeah. one of the lines they say on it. They and so for people who may not be familiar, the captain's yacht is a sort of private shuttlecraft that the captain has. They established it in the background materials to Next Generation. So mm-hmm. Captain Picard had a captain's yacht, and he named his. And Patrick Stewart decided that the name of Picard's captain's yacht is the Calypso after uh, Jacques Cousteau's ship. Mm-hmm. Um, but they never used it. We never saw it or heard about it on camera. Mm-hmm. And if memory serves, it was like supposed to be located at the base of the saucer mm-hmm. section. Yes, you know. Yep. Um, so it, it may not have looked like a normal shuttlecraft, right? but it, yeah, it kind of looked like the, the, the stereotypical UFO saucer. It's yeah. a cutout on the bottom of the, of the saucer section though. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, it's nice to finally have it, have a captain's yacht used on camera. And I was glad Boimler pointed out that that's what it was. Yeah. Yes. That was, that was nice. Now, um, the, now the, using the, the, throwing the ship as, as a, uh, to a battering ram, basically, mm-hmm. right? You saw that in Picard season three, where they took uh, Beverly yep. Crusher's ship and threw it at the Titan. Yeah, right. I was I was thinking about the the combat battle tactics they used in Picard season three as oh they're doing the same kind of stuff now. Yep. Um. Yeah. In the uh, the Enterprise E, the in Star Trek Insurrection, mm-hmm. uh, it was named the Cousteau on that one, which is a Jacques Cousteau thing, and yep. uh, they actually they used that. The captain's yacht in that one oh, in the movie okay. Insurrection, right? Okay, because isn't that, that what he loaded the the Argo the 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 ATV into? No, that was a that was a regular shuttle. No, the in, in that's that's Insur- a different movie. Insurrection okay. is we're going to break the Prime Directive to save two hundred space cities. Oh, right. Yeah, including uh, the girl that that Picard yeah. fell in love with. That's right. 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 It was that's how they got down to the surface of Baku. Yeah. Um, Incidentally, I like how now it makes no sense to take all of your senior officers and put them on the captain yacht for this mission. But that's what they do on Star Trek. Yep. <laughs> yeah, you know? That's right. It's and so what the natural implication of that is, is you've got your, you've got your lower deckers manning the shop back, yeah. you know, back on the ship. And so yep. it's nice. It was really satisfying to me, even though they don't have big parts to see the lower, all of the different lower deckers, including the different watches, members of the different mm-hmm. watches, they all step up to man the Cerritos in the absence of the senior officers. And yeah. it was really nice to have them shine in that way. Right. You know, it really was a, a counter counter to Locarno's crews who were all lower deckers who had rebelled and mm-hmm. took control of their ship. This instead was lower deckers who were working with their captain under orders of the captain and, you know, and taking charge of the ship. So we need to talk about the, uh, 
ion storm sequence when uh, oh, yes. the Mariner takes the 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 uh, Pacero into the uh, ion storm and um, it's very total- much Wrath of Khan. That was that so was right thing, out of Wrath of Khan. Yeah, the first thing <laughs> is the music. The, I hear the music. Mm-hmm. I'm like, that's that's Wrath of Khan music, right? And I'm mm-hmm. saying to myself, I, in fact, I wrote that down in my notes. That's Wrath of Khan. And then we have the same shots, like the passing yes. over, and uh, it was just so well done. It was so, so good. I, I was so happy they did that. Yeah, people may not remember, but in Wrath of Khan, so it, a lot of the climax takes place in the Matara Nebula, where you have Khan's ship, and um, which is stolen, mm-hmm. and the Enterprise. And the, because they're in this nebula, their sensors aren't great. And they they actually for once use three dimensions, yep. in mm-hmm. in space combat. So you know, like um, because Khan can't see where Kirk is, Kirk is able to get the Enterprise behind him by going under him or above him or stuff like that. And they do that here, which is really mm-hmm. nice. I thought they might actually do a little bit more with the because it it doesn't really come into the verbal to the dialogue level this is Mm -hmm. all visual um it's the the nebula that they're in here or ion storm or whatever it is it's purple like the matara Mm -hmm. nebula is in Khan. um and we've got a genesis device right you know which we know is going to go off and then when it does go off we get exactly the same kind of imagery it's done yes. here in animation yes. but we get the same concentric circles moving out from the point of detonation in the nebula and i i put in my notes i feel young yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we got the once upon a time music even at the end of that mm-hmm. you know that that we got mm-hmm. in wrath of Khan. yeah mm-hmm. that's well, what I thought they would do something on the dialogue level, though, that would mm. tie Mariner into the Kirk role and tie Locarno into the Khan role. Well, and they didn't do that. I would have liked it even more if they had done that. And they, they actually kind of flipped that because it was Mariner's ship that got disabled and mm. the the Genesis device was detonated on instead of the Carnos. <laughs> right. Carnal was the yeah. attacker that disabled the ship and Mariner's ship got disabled the same way. Um uh, the Reliant did in Wrath of Khan. So they kind of flipped that aspect of it, but it's mm. still, I mean, it was, just, it was such a nice touch to have kind of those, as soon as she turned into that ion storm, it's like, Oh, this is Wrath of Khan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And she tells him in the confrontation, you know, don't let anger define your life. Don't, you're not a murderer. And that's a kind of a nice <laughs> and, moment. And he says, Oh, but I really am. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <right. laughs> but but it's kind of a, an interesting moment because that's what Locarno has done. He's let anger define who he is, and ever since that incident, you know, and had to leave the academy, he's been angry, and it's defined all of his life goals to, to where he is now. Even to the point where he undermines himself, his anger. He's it's supposed to be this whole hippie, you know, we're all equal. Uh, on you know among Fleet. the lower deckers, yeah, mm-hmm. and then he starts ordering people around <laughs> to do what I say. I just love the fact that Robert Duncan McNeil is playing this part because it's yeah. so yes. different than Tom Paris. It's so similar but so different, right? Yeah, he plays right. even the voice, his voice inflection and everything. He changes it just enough to show that as a different character. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Now in Wrath of Khan, you know, part of the problem at the climax <laughs> is Khan has set his Genesis device to go off. And the engines, but the Enterprise has had so much damage that that it can't move. And the, and Kirk has a line like, "Scotty, you've got four minutes, or we're all dead." Mm-hmm. You right know, to get it moving, and then at the last minute, it zooms out. Well, here because Mariner has been transported to the captain's yacht, that's the ship that needs to get out of here and flee. And Kayshawn has this awesome moment where he just says, Mirab with sails unfurled. And it's like, I don't need a translation. I totally got you. <laughs> <laughs> we got to go now. Gotta go. Let's go. Fast, fast, fast. <laughs> so the, the planet, they named the planet Locarno, which is actually a nice, a nice touch that they would they name it after a guy who had done, after everything he had done, they I named it after they were him. rubbing it in. Maybe. Well, maybe. And, and, and they even said that part of his, part of his atoms are, are, part of it his atoms are part of it now now i I know logically speaking this is impossible but i wonder if lower decks is going to take that route and and maybe do secrets of uh, search for spock 
and have Locarno resurrected no. somehow on this planet next season. That would be, I would accept that better than the J.J. Abrams riff on Wrath of Khan. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Because I, I this yeah. is comedy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, it, it would, it would, it, yeah, it would somehow, we, somehow we resurrected, you know, the whole uh, Rise of Skywalker thing. I, I hope not. I, I honestly don't. I just want to, you know, this was great for one season. Let's go on to something else next season. I, yeah. I, I, and I agree. I don't think they will, but I would be able to accept it better than other similar parallels to Wrath of Khan. Right. I, I could see them doing something with the planet. I could see them yeah. coming back to the planet, but let's not bring back Nick Lacarno. Yeah. I mean, I could see the whole, like, the planet rapidly, uh, you know, unstable, rapidly developing and having the giant worms and doing something with I, that. I assume that they've had, I assume they've fixed the problems with mm -hmm. the Genesis device. I would assume. Because otherwise yeah. the Ferengi wouldn't be having one. Yeah. yeah. And they, yeah. they did say that the planet was stable. When right. Admiral okay. was talking to Freeman, yeah. so, um, so at the end of this one, Tendi is off on her Orion, you know, leaving Starfleet. This is another season ending with one of our lower deckers leaving. Um, mm -hmm. Presumably, she'll be back. She's not just being. Oh replaced. no! Oh no! no they're totally. She's going to be back in no time. They're yeah. explicitly acknowledging the fact that the lower deckers are not leaving. Right. And they're just doing this for a season ender, and then they'll be back next season. Yeah, and it'll so, be interesting to see how she comes back. That's that'll so be fun. Now, now I want a Mistress of the Winter Constellation series. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so this is something I noticed, and maybe I'm wrong, but to me, it looked like at the end of that, the star field that they show the credits over mm -hmm. shifted from animated, like the the, the animation of, mm -hmm. of Lower Decks, to CG, like you would have in a live action series. Am I wrong? And is it, or is that not, is that significant? Or am I just reaching? I didn't see that. I, what I mm -hmm. saw is we get a shot of Tendi looking out a window and behind her in the, in space is the animated Cerritos. And then when the Orion ship goes to warp, the Cerritos shrinks and vanishes as yep. the star field starts moving by it. That's what I remember. I don't remember a shift from, I think that, I think the star field is normally generated by CGI on, yeah. okay. on lower decks as are the exteriors of the ships. Okay. It's yeah. It's, I, it, yeah. They've, they've shown their willingness to kind of play with the animations too. So, mm -hmm. I mean, like yeah. we talked about last episode that there were some variants on, on the animation yeah. styles and stuff like that. So, I mean, again, I, I'd, I'd like to see if it is an opening for a, even like a, a short treks type thing, you know, where they have a that couple of be, short episodes with Tendi. That's what I'm getting butt. at. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, I would like to have some fun uh, Tendi as an Orion oh, I think butt live action. I, I, oh, well, I don't know that we're going to get no. live action, but come yeah. next season, we're going to get at least one episode where we meet uh, Devana in Orion pirate mode and... Mm having mixed emotions about it right yeah. right but she'll so, be back she'll, she'll be back on the cerritos eventually uh and then uh, this is the first uh season finale of lower decks where the cerritos is not <laughs> heavily damaged and mm -hmm. he actually comes out of it relatively intact so that's something that to, to note so uh that's the end of season four uh, can i get your overall impressions of the season uh you know, Father Corey, what did you think of season four of lower decks i i thought it was it was a lot of fun um it, you know, it, it, as I sort of think about, I'm not going to try to compare with the other seasons, you know, because all all the seasons had their strengths, all the seasons had their weakness, and they all they've all been good as a whole. And I really enjoyed this one. I think that the story arc was very interesting. I liked I liked the idea of the story arc. Where first it looked like this unknown ship was destroying the other ships, but then it turned out that it was actually uh, capturing them and then uh, beaming off the the captains and the whole rebellion of the lower decks versus the. Starfleet lower deck crew, the Cerritos lower deck crew uh, staying together and even being the strength of the Cerritos was the lower decks. And I think it was as a, as a whole, the season was, was very enjoyable and it was an excellent, you know, I don't remember if we had any episodes where one or more of us kind of said, this wasn't a great episode. I think all the episodes were very well done. I, I, I enjoyed all the episodes from, from what I can recall. Yeah, it was, it was excellent. Uh, how about you, Jimmy? I enjoyed the season very much, too. I'd have to go back since 
I didn't know this question was coming. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'd, I'd have to go back and look at a list of the episodes to see which ones I thought were better than others. Um, like Caves, I remember thinking, eh, it's okay, it's fun, but it's not, you know, it's it's kind of it's disconnected, you know, mm -hmm. from everything else. It doesn't really advance the season plot. So it, it wasn't the high point of the season for me. It was still an enjoyable episode, but it just wasn't, you know, a peak episode in my view. It was pleasant, but not great. Um, others I found much funnier, um, mm -hmm. and, but I'd have to look to see which ones they were. But I still think, to, to, to my mind, I enjoy Lower Decks even more than I enjoy Strange New Worlds. Mm -hmm. um, other people may have other preferences, but to me, this is the most fun of all of the current Star Treks. And so I enjoyed it very much. The season um, arc, I thought had a very slow build. Um, it is, it kind of reminded me of Doctor Who, where yeah. we have, in a lot of New Who, we have a season arc where there's something that we check in with either every episode or every few episodes, and then it becomes big at the end. This was very much in that formula where we had a mystery sighting, a sighting of the mystery ship every episode except caves. Mm. And, it, and at first, it's just destroying stuff. And we're getting these repeated lower deck scenes, which were fun to the point that we know what's happening in these scenes. You've got <laughs> these lower deckers squabbling about moving up in ranks to the point that by the time we get to the binars late in the season, they're just arguing in binar. And we know exactly what's going on, even if we don't know exactly <laughs> what they're saying. Right. And that was a nice touch. Um, but once once we got to um, the the adjimus peanut hamper episode that gave us the twist that mm -hmm. these ships aren't just being destroyed they're being stolen and we, we also knew the episode before that where Fering i guess that same episode where the we saw the ferengi ship get uh stolen we knew at that point that there's some kind of conspiracy here involving the lower deckers because one of the Ferengi right. knew it, the, the mystery ship was coming. And right. so it started, it, it became much more interesting. The season arc became much more interesting as we went along. I like the fact the characters were not totally oblivious of it until the very end. Which, you know, like if you look in the, in the 2005 se season of Doctor Who, Bad Wolf is the season arc. And... All that that involves for most of the season is the words bad wolf keep showing up and the characters are oblivious to it mm -hmm. until the penultimate episode. And then all of a sudden, whoa, there has been bad wolf all over this whole series. And that kind of revelation can be effective. But in other things, you know, um, it's subtle enough. What I like about the bad wolf reveal is bad wolf was subtle enough that even the audience didn't notice it. Right. And then suddenly we get the shock of discovery. Whereas what happens in a lot of the time is the audience is aware of the season arc, but the characters are not. Yep. And so it kind of deflates it when the characters have the big revelation because the audience has been knowing what's going on the whole time. And so I like that, that they kept the audience and the characters largely on the same page. So the characters are thinking about the season plot and talking about it. And do, even though it's not the main action yet, it's still something where we're both audience and characters are mm -hmm. thinking about. Mm -hmm. So I, I liked it a lot. Um, also, in terms of this episode, I liked uh, we got Easter eggs like we can see Goodgy is still in the crew. Yep. Yep. Um, at one point, I like that when they do the Mark Twaining, um, Captain Freeman sees it's being successful and she's like, why does this work? And Talin, <laughs> Tal Talin says illogical tactics can sometimes lead to logical solutions, yeah. <laughs> which is true. Which is true. Nice to have a Vulcan admit that. Um, and, and I like how, even though Rutherford and whatever the other guy is, cause they, they, the reason they were using the Mark Twaining was because Rutherford and one of the other engineers had radically different ideas about what they needed to do in order to make the Orion ship usable. And they solved their differences by Mark Twaining in the holodeck. 
And um, I like the fact that even though they're getting along together in the holodeck and and being best buddies and complimenting each other with ridiculous expressions <laughs> loosely based on 19th century dialogue, um, <laughs> that at the end, when everyone goes to the bar to celebrate, um, Rutherford and the other guy still don't like each other. And it's like, yeah. I thought you we're best buddies now. So, oh, no, just when we're tweening. <laughs> <laughs> And then I like Nick Locarno's line at the end where he's almost got the bomb defused and then a face pops up and says, now please deposit two bars of latinum. And he's like, they put a paywall on a bomb? Stupid yeah. <laughs> Ferengi. Blam. Yep. <laughs> Which uh, the, uh, the, the, the memory alpha says that uh, is a callback to Kivan in uh, the DS9 uh -huh. episode, The Magnificent Ferengi. Uh -huh. I hate Ferengi. The, the, yeah. He was the um, yeah. Vorta. <laughs> so, uh, since we're talking about things, one thing we didn't mention is the the shield that Locarno used is a Trinar shield, and apparently mm -hmm. that must be what Q used because it's the same look as yes. Farpoint Station. I noticed right. that. Yeah, right. Yeah, nice, interesting. It's a super space shield design. By uh, the way, at the end of the so, if you've ever read the Ender Ender's Game novels. They have these two forks. One fork in of novels follows Ender's later career, and the other fork follows the career of a character named Bean. In mm. the fork that follows Ender, and the Bean fork is frankly better, but in the fork that follows Ender, you have this plot that moves, it moves increasingly slowly over books, and you spend several books waiting for a a disintegration bomb to arrive at this planet. It's called the bomb is called the the uh, MD or Little Doctor because it involves molecular disintegration MD. And you spend just novels waiting for the for the Little Doctor to arrive at this planet and disintegrate it. And in the very last novel, um, or at least when the bomb gets there. They are able, the characters are able to access the bomb before it detonates and shut it down immediately. And one of the characters explains they actually have the instructions for how to disarm the bomb <laughs> printed on the outside of the bomb because they don't want it going off when it shouldn't. And right. this is kind of the opposite of putting a paywall to disarm a bomb. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. I was thinking of Chekhov's uh, Genesis device when we first saw it, and uh, yep. yeah. not Pavel Chekhov, Anton <laughs> Chekhov. So, um, excellent. How about Any you, Dom? What did you think of the episode or the season? Oh, uh, the season. Oh, right. Let's um, put you on the spot now. I forgot. Yeah. Now. Oh, so early on, I felt like it wasn't as laugh out loud funny. Um, I mm -hmm. wasn't getting the the belly laughs or the out loud laughs that I that the previous seasons had given me, but by the end I was really enjoying it. And those last mm -hmm. three four episodes, I mean, certainly from Caves, Inner Fight, and and this one, I, uh, they had enough of the the Easter eggs and the funny jokes and the stuff, and it was sprinkled throughout. I mean, I I, I enjoyed elements all throughout. So. Um, I would say, I'm not comparing to previous seasons, but I would just say in, in general, I, the oh, way it turned out. Even though you asked us to compare to previous seasons. Oh, I just asked well, what you thought of the season as a whole. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I was misremembering that. Yes. But uh, in general, I, I think it was another successful Lower Deck season. I'm looking forward to season five, whenever that is. And it's fascinating to me that of all the, the, Star, the new Star Trek that's out there, the one that I see going on, unlimited essentially it could be lower decks the one that goes on longest uh could be lower decks certainly well, um, there, and there was kind of an interesting we had kind of an interesting discussion on discord about this how animation seems to be so much easier now than live action yes it's easier for them to produce it's easier for them to put out on a regular schedule because lower decks has pretty much come out every summer for the last four years as i remember correctly mm -hmm. yeah yeah, it's been very consistent. Whereas Discovery was supposed to be an annual thing, it hasn't been. Uh, Strange New Worlds hasn't been quite as consistent, but Lord Dex yep. is. And yep. you know, and and so we can presume that this time next year we'll be talking about the end of season five. 
Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I do too. Well, and yeah. it has been announced there is a season five that's yeah, in development. We know that. It has, yes. Yeah. Uh, the question is, is what else are we going to see? We the, the, Like a lot of the stuff that the, the uh, Michelle Yeoh, Section 31 Emperor Giorgio series has now been converted into a movie, like a Paramount Plus movie. Um, so we're not getting a series out of that. So the, there's a big question of what are we going, what when are we going to get and how much well, and- Star Trek are we going to get in the future? And Prodigy's moving over to Netflix. Yep. yep. The second season of Prodigy's moving to Netflix. So that at least that's coming out. That was right. canceled for a while. And so. should have a bigger audience, frankly. I think Netflix has a bigger audience than Paramount+. Yep. Plus. And also for a kid series, we only really need two episodes. I mean, sorry, two seasons. 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 Yeah. 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 So um, there's, yeah, there's other things out there, but I don't like looking for like looking to the future. I don't know. Like there is no definite plans for us aside from Prodigy. What's next from Star Trek? We don't have any next summer. Oh, no, well, sorry. The Discovery we, we're getting in the in the early part of 2024. But yeah, other than yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. And there's, <laughs> there's there's clearly talk going on behind the scenes about a Star Trek legacy project. Right. I was, oh, man, let's do it. So. Please, please. <laughs> All right. Um, that should do it. Unless you guys have anything else. Um we should move to our feedback. Um, our first feedback comes from Rogerio Schmidt, uh, writing on our last episode, in, uh, the discussion on the inner fight. Uh, this in, uh, he says, I don't know about you guys, but I think 2023 has probably been the best Star Trek year in a really long time. We've had Picard season three, Strange New World season two, and Lower Decks season four, all well above average. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, even yes. for people who who are not necessarily big fans of Picard, season three, by almost universal acclaim, was a big step up. Absolutely, yes. yeah, uh, I agree, and, and I would also agree. Like, I think twenty twenty three has been a banner year, and maybe why we might have a bit of a lull <laughs> yeah. after uh, this till, till we get some some uh, another great year of, of Star Trek. But we'll be well, here talking about classic Trek, so don't worry. Yeah, it, it, it was it was enjoyable that all three series that aired were great. The 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 other series uh, didn't air during twenty twenty three, and that's just fine. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then Ryan sent in an email discussing the fan series Star Trek Continues. He says because uh, that came up in our feedback last time, and he says uh, another vote for Star Trek Continues. I share the opinion with most Trek fans in regards to fan films. The majority have terrible writing and acting. However, Star Star Trek continues really pays homage to the original series and improves it in some ways. Mm-hmm. As with any show, the first few episodes aren't as polished or put together. However, the show really picks up and helps to bridge the gap between TOS and the motion picture. I actually consider the show headcanon. If you decide to do a Patreon special, I look forward to giving it a listen. Yeah, oh, it was. I, I enjoyed it. You know, I, I was yeah. watching it as it was coming out. You know, of course, over the course of a few years. I mean, it, it wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't quick and they got caught by uh, the Axanar problem yeah. with CBS where they wanted, they wanted to do 13 episodes, but they could only end, do 11. I think is what it ended up being. They got permission to do a final episode to close it out. Right. Um, but it's excellent. It, I really enjoy it. It's, it's worth watching. It really is. And they do have, yeah. yeah. And they do have people who come from TOS, either directly from mm-hmm. TOS, the guy who played Apollo in TOS came back mm-hmm. uh, yep. and, or the daughter of the Romulan captain. Yeah, and James Dewan's son character, right? Yeah, James Dewan's son played Scotty, yeah, Scotty for a while. Yeah. Walter Koenig. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, um, yep. Uh, yeah, that's an idea. Interesting idea to do a Patreon special on Star Trek Continuous. That, that we, we can think do about that. that. All right. So, thank you both for your feedback. We really do appreciate getting that. And we'd like to take a moment now to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Star Trek, including Cynthia S, Elisa L, Hannah G, Vincent B, and Catalina U. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Star Trek and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So that's it from us. We'd love to know what you think of this episode, Old Friends, New Planets, the finale of Lower Deck Season 4. You can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com slash trek or at our Facebook page at facebook.com slash starquestmedia. Send an email to trek at sqpn.com. Visit our Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, 
or watch the show on our YouTube channel and leave a comment there. And our YouTube channel is youtube.com slash StarQuest Media. We'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the Deep Space Nine episode, Rejoined. Until then, Father Corey Stika, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Star Trek. Thank you, Dom. And Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Yeah, not a big fan of Rejoined, but... <laughs> um... But uh, thank you, and live long and prosper. And once again, I'm Don Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Star Trek on StarQuest. And remember, come on, need somewhere to hide. Ooh, dangerous and unpredictable space debris.